Hi there, my name is Kristen Redbin, and I'm an associate professor here at San Jose State University, our iSchool, and I am so pleased to welcome everyone to our latest iSchool colloquium. And I'm happy to introduce Rebecca Hankins and Miguel Juarez, who will be presenting their recent work. Uh, just a little bit about Rebecca and Miguel. Rebecca is an associate professor and a certified archivist librarian who teaches courses on the use of primary sources for research in the areas of the African diaspora, women and gender studies, and Arabic language and culture. Her research and publications are centered on Muslims and black popular culture production and the archival and library and information science fields viewed from a critical race theory lens. She has co-edited a collection of essays with Miguel Juarez titled, Where Are All the Librarians of Color? The Experiences of People of Color in Academia. And now a little bit about Miguel. Uh, Miguel has an MLS from the State University of New York at Buffalo, their school of excuse me, School and in Information and Library Science, as well as a Master's in Border Studies from the University of Texas at El Paso in their history program. Uh, he's currently working there on his doctorate in U.S. Borderlands and Urban History, and he is an activist and scholar uh, who blogs and writes about archives, Chicano studies, cultural studies, digital humanities, diversity issues, historic tourism, and preservation information science, social media, and transborder labor <laughs> issues. <laughs> <laughs> so the title of their talk today, and we're so pleased to have them, is Do We Need Climate Change? Where Diversity Meets the Academic Library and Archives Environment. So please join me in welcoming, I don't know if you can virtually <laughs> me, um, uh, in welcoming Rebecca and Miguel to the iSchool. I'll turn the mic over to Rebecca and Miguel now. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Kristen. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity. We want to welcome everyone to our session. Uh, I'm Rebecca, of course, and my co-presenter. is Miguel Juarez, and uh, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, this is a great topic, well, we feel. Yes. And so our presentation, of course, is based on our book that was recently published by Library Juice Press uh, in January of this year. We are really pleased to be able to talk about this book and give our uh, co-editors, our co-essayists uh, and collaborators uh, credit for the wonderful work that they did. So let's get started. Okay, some of the goals or takeaways for uh, uh, this uh, session are that uh, you get an awareness of diversity issues specifically in academic libraries and archives. Um, uh, that you define and articulate important concepts related to diversity, multiculturalism, microaggression, subversive racism, critical race theory and intersectionality. Uh, many of our contributors address these issues and concepts in our book, and uh, we divided the book into sections, but some of the contributions address uh, uh, most of the things in, in the area, but they also kind of float around to other sections of the book, as, as you shall see, as we'll see. Okay. Uh, okay. So one of the first things that we were asked is why publish another book on diversity? And Miguel and I had talked about this and talked about this. So when we first sent out requests, we received emails from a number of people all saying, oh, I just read this article, it's already been written, there's a book that's been written on this subject, and we were given all of this uh, information. And I, as if that should be the end of it. Why are you doing this? We don't need another one. So we, we felt the need to challenge people to say, why is there all of this dialogue around uh, information literacy and some of the other issues? And we, we felt that 
that there needed to be something more on diversity. We need to have as much information on diversity as we have on information literacy, as uh, other concepts of uh, collection development. So we challenged those who responded to, to us to think of this as an ongoing dialogue, dialogue with many different perspectives that should be explored, commented on, and argued. We felt the need to, that this needed to be a part of the information studies canon in the same way that other important issues are in libraries and archives. We wanted our contributors to write from their heart without censors. Miguel and I felt that there needed to be this corpus of research and writings on diversity and the experiences of people of color and librarianship and archives similar to some of the other concepts that are out there in the um, archival and, lit and, and library world. So we, we ask our, our, our writers to look at recruitment and retention, job satisfaction, the history of their profession. And we, we tried to make sure we reviewed the literature and looked at the obstacles that we all faced in this, um, in our roles in information literacy and uh, in information studies. So it was very important that we have the additional materials in the same way that we look at any other issue within uh, society, within our profession too. So this, this um, you can go to the next. Um, uh, so we basically asked computers to write, uh, contributors to write their essays from a theoretical and or practical experience on the following topics. Um, the glass ceiling, you know, there's only so far that uh, um, librarians of color uh, in the academic uh, library field can go. I mean, we really don't get much training and management. Um, so. Um, the glass ceiling is is, is uh, real, and then there are also stereotypes. There's stereotypes uh, on who we are. Many of us have the experience of uh, having been the only Latino librarian in uh, in the library, and those stereotypes abound. Uh, maybe they might not know the dominant culture does not know. Um, enough of us to kind of say that we all are different. You know, there are a lot of issues. So again, um, the lack of managerial opportunities. And then uh, also the expectations from our communities. Uh, our communities expect certain things uh, from us. Uh, sometimes uh, we have to go to too many uh, activities and uh, because, uh, again, maybe we're the only ones in our uh, institutions that are, that are working there. So we see, we're seen as kind of like a tie to the community. And then there are also expectations from our institutions. Our institutions might, um, you know, see us as we're the spokesperson of our uh, ethnic group, which, which, which we are not. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are certain expectations from the institution. Uh, when there's a training for diversity, guess who gets asked first to go in? We do. <laughs> and then uh, there's issues with collaborations with other units and other teaching faculty. Uh, there's also a need to strengthen the pipeline. You know, I think uh, we think there's a pipeline in place, but it needs to be stronger. We need to be able to recruit, retain, and promote uh, libraries of color through the pipeline. There are issues of re in retention and, and promotion of uh, uh, for academic uh, librarians of color, and it on the average it 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 uh, parallels some of the same promotion activity. Uh, not always as uh, regular teaching faculty. It's like a seven-year period, uh, and you're um, evaluated all throughout the way. There are also issues. In in, in, in tokenism, uh, maybe they include this to committees after the fact because they need a person of color. Uh, and 
there are also very real discrimination and litigation issues, which um, unfortunately by the time you get to uh, uh, to this topic, you know, a lot of things have, ha have happened and you have to deal with it the best way that you can. Next slide. So we sent out the call for essays and we were really uh, surprised and pleased that we received over uh, 25 submissions, uh, 13 essays were chosen for this particular book. We had 27 contributors out of those 13 essays. And as Miguel mentioned, we divided the uh, book into three sections after the preface and introduction. And with those 25 submissions, we, we, we had actually planned on, and we still do plan on writing three books. So this first one was looking at people of color in academia. <clears throat> the second book, we really wanted to look at the public library, and uh, this is more, uh, as we said, uh, looking at academic libraries, but we really did want to look at the experiences of librarians in the public sector and in the corporate sector because these are all issues that, that we all face. And then the third one we wanted to do was going to look at law librarians because that is a specialized field, yes, but there are very real issues that they face also that mirror what we all face as uh, people of color. So we're hoping to still get those other two books out and we're, we're hope to have that uh, publisher for those uh, soon. So these are the three areas that we chose to look at and we're going to look a little bit further into these three sections. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, um, we're looking for someone to write uh, the preface to the book and um, I think this was around December, around Christmas time, right? Right, mm -hmm. Rebecca? Yes, yes. And so um, we thought, who could we get to write the preface uh, um, whose work really ex exemplifies who we wanted to uh, to um, uh, present in what we're writing and also um, what kind of articles are being contributed. So we decided to ask Dr. Lorraine Roy Miguel uh, decided to ask Dr. Lorraine Roy because I, I told him I, she will never agree to this, but he insisted. So, yes, no, Miguel and, contacted and, her. And, and Dr. Roy is a <laughs> Facebook friend, so I said, hmm, maybe I should ask her on Facebook. And, uh, and she uh, agreed. Uh, Dr. Roy is, uh, is the 1997 to 1998 president of, of the American Library, uh, American Indian Library Association, and oh. she was the president of ALA in 07 and 08. Okay. Uh, and uh, she teaches graduate courses in basic reference, library instruction, information literacy, readers advisory, indigenous librarianship, and information in social and cultural contexts, which I think is exciting. And she has written and uh, widely and delivered over 500 formal presentations around the world. So I thought she'd be great and she agreed. <laughs> and uh, we're very glad that she did and she did it. Uh, she did it kind of like under under a deadline. Right, mm -hmm. Rebecca? Yes, she did. She's very, very nice to do it. And, and uh, it's important to know that this publication is under uh, a series of uh, a monograph series that Library Juice has called Critical Multiculturalism and in Information Studies. Uh, and and uh, we were the series editors uh, uh, when, when we started this uh, project. And um, this, this provides an opportunity to write about some of these critical issues that we kind of see in this uh, publication. And we do feel that um, the contributors have provided some, uh, like uh, Dr. Uh, Roy states, they've provided some very different perspectives on the topic. And I think, in a way, new kinds of perspectives on the topic. Back to uh, Rebecca's idea that this is an ongoing dialogue of, uh, mm -hmm. 
of, of, of scholarship and research. Okay, next. So you can go to the next. So um, this was what our main theme was, is trying to make sure that this idea of diversity is an ongoing discussion and that people are really talking about this in serious personal ways. So I'll tell you a little bit about how Miguel and I, Miguel and I wrote the introduction together. But after we received all of the essays and after we, we um, looked at every, what we received were not the essays but abstracts about what their essays were going to be. And so we looked at them together, we, we uh, created a, Miguel created a spreadsheet, we scored each of the abstracts uh, separately and then we came together to see if there was any disputes that we might have and um, we talked about anything that we felt that were, were, was a problem and how we should address our response to each of the individuals who had taken the time to send us their abstract. And if there was any disputes, we decided um, he kept one and I would keep one. If there was one that we didn't agree on, we would, we would each keep one of those that we didn't agree on. We provided the contributors after we had chosen the 13 essays, we provided them deadlines for when they were to have their contribution back to us. Most people were, were very much on deadline, on time. I mean, we really had a great group of of essay writers, I mean, they listened to what we have, I, I, we kept in contact with them and that's the one thing I, I will say about any time you write a book and you're, a lot of people talk about it as herding cats, but we did not feel we had that kind of a problem with right. our contributors. They were very much anxious and, and happy to work with us. And so we provided them uh, feedback on when the, the deadline for the final chapters. After we had pulled the entire manuscript together, it was sent off to the publisher and they had an editor that looked over the entire manuscript, the manuscript and gave, got back to us if there was any concerns. We sent it to our contributors and they were really good about give, getting back to us um, any edits that needed to be done. Uh, we sent that off to the publisher and then we uh, waited. <laughs> they were working on the index and the cover was made, uh, the proofs, they, they um, had the proofs done and the book was published. I think the entire um, process took what, maybe a, a two years? Two years. Yes. Yes, and, and, and I also wanted to add that um, we were planning on uh, publishing uh, two or three books in the series because we received uh, enough submissions from contributors, but then um, uh, we were um, we we were kind of told that that was not going to happen. So, so uh, uh, there 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 was one essay. That was really good, and so we decided to reach out to this contributor, uh, who's I think he's a doctoral student, right? And uh, yes. to see if um, we would add, we could add his essay uh, to the book. And of course, he said yes, and uh, which is good because it adds another uh, voice to this uh, continuing dialogue. Okay. Okay, some some of the terminology uh, that's used in the book, uh, of course, diversity. Diversity is the inclusion, welcome, and support of individuals from all groups. Um, these characteristics can include, but are not limited to age, background, citizenship, disability, education, and uh, so forth. There's the concept of multiculturalism, which is pluralism, minority, uh, it speaks about minority and majority populations. It's inclusive of our cultures within society. 
There's uh, also uh, one uh, contributor that speaks about critical race theory. And uh, critical race theory, or, or CRT, is a critical examination of society and culture at the intersection of race, law, and power. Emphasis on power. Uh, intersectionality is uh, intersecting att attributes that comprise an individual's various identity. Like you might be um, uh, a certain person in one group, uh, you might have a family, you might be a mother, and just various things. Uh, there are also microaggressions. We've been hearing about microaggressions uh, frequently now. And these are everyday verbal or nonverbal or environmental slides, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely on their marginalized group membership. There's also aversive racism, unconscious, and that's unconscious affinity for one's own racial or ethnic group common in the hiring process negative evaluations of minority groups that are different from one that is used to um, and how it relates to discrimination, the yeah, socio or economic status. There's also a concept called covering and dissemblance. And uh, some of the uh, known authors for this are Kenji Yoshino, who wrote a book called Covering. Uh, or uh, Melissa Harris Perry, who wrote a, a book called Sister Citizen. And this is uh, trying to fit in, smiling, concealing one true self, trying to mitigate any concerns people would have about you as an equal, trying not to be the outlier or uh, Devin's Carbate's fifth black woman, or all these identity constructs involving hiding your true self performing your identity in a way that makes you feel less of an outsider. And uh, lastly, there's racial realism. You know, the scholar and attorney and mentor of President Obama, the late Derek Bell, argues that racism is endemic and a permanent part of current society and our social history. For example, critical race theory reflects racism as a permanent part of American society and has been so through history, throughout history. And we'll make sure we give you um, some of these uh, definitions. Um, a lot of these things most uh, people of color have faced, especially in, in the academic environment. Okay. Right. Next. So these are the sections that we divided the book into. So section one is setting the stage for diversity in the profession. And in this uh, particular section, these are some of the questions that the uh, authors try to address. And so one was what ingredients need to be in place to facilitate diversity in institutions and beyond human resource personnel, whose role is it to foster diversity? So the, one, the first essay that was written was by Emily Chan, Giovanni Lota, Holly Smith, and Stephen Booth. And this particular uh, essay was called, their essay is titled Discovering Librarianship, Personalizing the Recruitment Process for Underrepresented Students. It focused on the experiences of these four professionals. And it looked at how they worked in the ALA Office of Diversity. Uh, and in this IMLS funded uh, program that they were a part of called Discovering Librarianship Program. And it relates to strengthening the pipeline, mentoring others, and dealing with community expectations for librarians of color. The second essay was by Tarita uh, um, Natasha, Latrice Booker, Althea Lazaro, and Martha Parker. And their essay was titled Establishing a Communal Network for Professional Advancement Among Librarians of Color. And I, I'm telling you, we're telling you about 
these contributors, because hopefully if you don't get a chance to read the entire book, you'll some of these essays will resonate with you and you will want to look at their uh, contribution and and it may have some impact on you and your your work environment. So their essay um, examines the ways in which collaborative partnerships amongst librarians of color both within and even across institutions can greatly assist in job satisfaction, retention of professional and bolster librarians' sense of support throughout their careers. Their essay also address specific examples and models in which these collaborations have occurred, including those in which the authors themselves experienced. The third chapter was Melody Royster, David Schweider, Ava Brillant, and Lori Drivers, and their essay was titled Mentoring and Retention of Minority Librarians. And it used qualitative and quantitative data to explore the ways in which mentoring programs succeed and fail minority librarians. And they looked at uncovering some of the potential strategies for effective mentorship. And uh, the, they also looked at the lack there of the, they analyzed the impact that mentoring and the lack thereof had on, has on minority librarians. Readers will be more informed and empowered to create improve, and improve mentoring programs to truly support librarians they seek to serve. Jason Kelly Austin's uh, essay looked at how the use of the terms of diversity and uh, diversity for resident librarians affect their treatment within their host institutions. His, his essay resonate, should resonate very strongly with many of uh, the other library resident essays that were in here. And his essay was titled, Interns or Professionals, a Common Misnomer Applied to Diversity Resident Librarians Can Potentially Degrade and Divide. And the last, go ahead. Uh, I, no, no, uh, I just wanted to ask a, a quick question, but no, uh, continue and, and then okay, I can the ask my question. The last essay was Agnes Bradshaw's very insightful um, essay, Strengthening the Pipeline Talent Management for Libraries, a Human Resources Perspective. And she talks about the whole idea of talent management practices and how do you develop that within your profession. Her essay, also examine the representation of people of color within the profession and assesses how talent management strategies can be utilized to ensure that librarians of color are included um, throughout as, as one of those populations represented in our professional ranks. Um, Go ahead. Um, thanks, Rebecca. I wanted to ask a, a question. This chapter, uh, this section, and many of the uh, individuals who worked on essays in this section talk about um, diversity resident programs. Uh, can we have a show of hands? And I don't know if this allows us to do this. How many of you have been residents or are thinking of being residents or, um, um, yes, those two questions. Does, does this allow us to raise our hands somehow? It uh, says you can raise your hand with the third button from the left just below your name. Okay. <laughs> okay, I raised my hand. Anybody else has been in a library residency program? I have. No of a li library residency program you uh, were going to apply to or uh, I, I think both Rebecca and I were in a library residency yes. program. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, so <laughs> I guess we can continue. Thank you. Okay, section two is how diversity benefits the profession. Uh, and the questions in, in this section um, that uh, most of the contributors address is how can we achieve support 
of current libraries of color while at the same time create more pipelines to attract a diverse workforce. And, you know, diversity is an issue that's being discussed broad based, not only in librarianship, but other companies as well. Uh, and how can current librarians of color be supported, promoted, and retained? Uh, some other concepts in uh, this uh, section include race relations, critical race theory, uh, navigating terrains of tokenism, uh, and so forth. And um, in uh, uh, this this section, um, uh, these essays uh, seek to address uh, these ideals by detailing tangible ways that these statements are proven despite tremendous odds, both in the academic and uh, archival professions that we feel are really uh, falling short of, of uh, those uh, goals. Uh, the first essay is uh, by Chandra Walker, and it's titled Critical Race Theory and the Recruitment and Retention of a Librarian of Color, a Counter Story. So she uses critical race theory as a theoretical framework for the recruitment and retention of academic librarians of color. She examines issues uh, dealing with white privilege, interest convergence, and counter stories to understand the issues of library education for people of color and for the history of higher education in America. Uh, the second essay is, is um, Alika No Akia. Akia. <laughs> and, her, and her essay is titled Serving with a Sense of Purpose, a Black Woman Librarian in Rural New Mexico. And uh, uh, that's, you know, this is a very interesting essay because she talks about what it's like to be an African uh, American woman uh, in a, a place that has deep-seated racial and gender roles. Uh, and in her effort to create a learning center for students, faculty, um, and the community at large in Carlsbad, New Mexico, that's where the caverns are located. Uh, she writes about the challenges of being one of the few black professionals in a predominantly white environment and what her presence says about her commitment to the philosophy of service of others. Uh, the other uh, contributor in this section is Vince Lee. His essay is titled, Like a Fish Out of Water But Forging My Own Path. Um, and uh, this is one of two essays written by archivists. And Lee discusses his career from his perspective as a Chinese American man who has worked with African American and now women's studies collections. He discusses how working in these two environments gave him an, gave him an opportunity to reflect not only on preconceived notions and stereotypes of what archivists should serve in which institutions and roles, but also the self imposed biases and discrimination we have in regards. Uh, as to how we see ourselves and how we fit in the profession. And uh, the last essay is by my co-editor, Rebecca Hankins. <laughs> She's written a very insightful and fascinating uh, essay called Radical Realism or Foolish Optimism, an African-American Muslim woman in the field. And she deals with a number of identity, identity issues related to what people of color experience in American society. A particular focus is Derek Bell's concept of racial realism. Although this concept should be considered very pessimistic, the author, uh, Rebecca, discusses how she really permits people <laughs> of color, how it really permits people of color the freedom to work from a platform of self empowerment. <laughs> Okay. All right, we're we'll going to next slide. So section three was looking at personal diversity stories and we, some of the questions that we looked at were, do you think that personal diversity stories is an effective, is it an effective tool to share the nuances of diverse experiences or sometimes the lack of it in the profession? 
Do you think the stories in Section 3 are effective? Why or why not? And do you have other questions, comments not answered in the previous section? So these particular um, questions, we answered them by telling our unique stories, seeing ourselves in the profession and scholarship, generational shared experience, and when will the climate change? And the essays that we have in this one, the first one was written by R Rhonda Fowler and Karen Rogers Collins. And their essay was titled, The Veteran and the Rookie, Our Story, Our Experience. And this is the shared experience of two African-American librarians at a mid-sized Midwestern university. One, per, one of the librarians has spent her entire career working primarily in academia. The other librarian has spent her career working in special libraries, but was new to the profession. So they talked about how they looked at the profession from, as two women of color. The second essay was Stacy Brinkman, Jacqueline Johnson, Kwabina Sayiri, and Elias Zock. And their essay was titled Diversity at Miami University Library for Unique and Similar Experiences. And their, um, their essay uh, talked about the experiences of five librarians recruited to the Miami University Library's Minority Residency Program in order to cre increase diversity amongst the staff and to encourage librarians of color to enter the profession. Their essay traces the experiences through the residency program and what happened to them since they uh, concluded that residency. And it also talks about what happened to them when they moved into permanent positions within the library, having received promotion and tenure, and also one of them who moved into the position of dean and university librarian. So these are really unique stories. The third, excuse me, the third essay <clears throat> was by Roland Barksdale Hall, and it was called Building Dialogic Bridges to Diversity. Are we there yet? And his essay was written from the perspective of an African-American cultural keeper, library educator, and academic library administrator. He, uh, he looked at the review of the literature, and he had a very interesting oral history that he included with uh, a, an older uh, librarian who had been in the field for a while. And so he looked at librarian practitioner journals, case studies, and leadership theory. He, and, at the, and he also looked at the struggles, trials, and tribulations that, although they had not dampened his spirit, sometimes he, you see librarians needing to change direction and do something else, but not give up totally on the profession. Our last essay was by my co-editor, Miguel Juarez, and his essay was titled, Making Diversity Work in academic libraries. San Paulo, you're going to have to say that. No holds barred is what it means in those. Can you do the Spanish, Miguel? No, well, originally it was going to have uh, the title, uh, Sin Pelos en la Lengua, which means no holds barred. But I thought, you know, so many people are not <laughs> going to get it. So I just uh, left it at that. Making diversity work in academic libraries. It's like, it's like making a um, a bad relationship work anyway, kind of <laughs> like that. And and so it, in it, I talk about kind of some kind of radical concepts uh, real quickly, uh, querying the academic library profession. Uh, but I, by querying, I mean othering it. Uh, so they accept people who are different, uh, creating an academic library report card. So we know uh, where we should go apply and where we should not go apply, because uh, if the climate has an F in diversity, I don't know, we have to be uh, uh, weary of going there to apply and work. Yeah, so it, it, it definitely was one of those essays that um, looked at something that we weren't discussing that we, we should be discussing 
and it it was written in the way of broadening that conversation and and bringing in those diverse voices. The book we feel has been great. Uh, uh, it's been reviewed here and there on blogs, and um, uh, uh, Rebecca uploaded. Uh, we we were given the opportunity to upload to our um, our institutional uh, repositories and 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 uh, uh, Rebecca's um, essay has been downloaded like 1,172 times and it's been viewed uh, over 1,500 times. And uh, I'll be contacting my uh, uh, person at UT El Paso to see if I can upload it. Uh, I, I work there as an assistant instructor, but uh, meanwhile, I've uploaded it in academia.edu and it, it, it's had uh, the, well, I've uploaded the front matter and in, including my chapter the front matter and table of contents and, and the preface and introduction, which we're going to give you a link to at the end of this presentation, mm -hmm. has 123 views to date. So um, I think uh, people are reading it and they're reading it in the online environment. I don't know about buying the book. Maybe some uh, uh, library uh, faculty will make it a, a required reading in their courses. <laughs> <laughs> So you want to yeah. say something about the book? Right? Yes, I did. Uh, I, I did receive an email from a friend or not, a, a colleague, and what she said about the book, I, I think you will find that, um, and I th thought it was a great, I asked her permission to use her her statement to me, and what she said was really, really makes you feel that what you've done is worthwhile. She said that I have to say the reading where all the library where are all the librarians of color was the first time I saw my feelings and experiences put down into words by other people, and that made me feel much less alone and also more optimistic that things may change. So I think that there is an audience for more writings on diversity that they always tell you to pick your battles, and I tell students all the time, pick diversity as your battle, because that's what I've done. No, and I think the book's been a great forum to get many of these ideas out. There are many issues that uh, the contributors talk about that I don't think have been addressed in other books. Uh, like I was a contributor to that uh, library residency program book that was published uh, how many years ago, Rebecca? Uh, mm -hmm. And 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 the issues yeah. were different. They were more about uh, applying to a residency program uh, and some other issues that you dealt with it, but not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a need to write about these issues that uh, make uh, sense and are significant to people in these situations. And I think yes. the contributors have done that. Yes, absolutely. So, so that's you. about it. I think the last one, we want to thank you. We want any questions that you might have. Um, the book is available from Amazon. It's available from um, the the press that we used. It's available. I think they said you can you can get it as an ebook. Uh, Library Juice also has it on its website. I think they lowered the price uh, to like thirty five dollars. So I, we we hope that it's worthwhile. We we felt it was. We thought it was definitely a need for it. So um, hopefully you will too. And we'd love to have your feedback, any comments, any questions that you might have of us, um, anything that you want to know about the process too of writing a book and getting people to um, work with you. So. If anybody has any questions about that, let us know. Thank you yeah. so much, Rebecca and Miguel. I'm 
I'm uh, using my applause that <laughs> everybody else will figure theirs out as well. Uh, it seems to me we have plenty of time uh, to pose any questions we have. Uh, I guess from my perspective, because I teach a course on diversity uh, for LIS graduate students, I'm wondering from your professional experiences, what do you feel that just your average student uh, needs to understand about diversity from the perspective of uh, professional development or, or being a good colleague or uh, because, I mean, you can kind of teach this course from multiple directions. You can teach it from the perspective of theory of uh, diversity, you know, kind of like you could do a whole course on critical race theory, you know, you can, yes. you can teach a course on uh, uh, services to diverse populations. But what you're talking about today really is about the professional trajectories of people of color and, you know, that represent all different dimensions of diversity. So, so what do you think that would be really exciting for faculty members to be teaching in their LIS classes <laughs> right now? <laughs> well, I think students really need to get to know uh, uh, people from diverse backgrounds. That's very important. And I know uh, that effort is made, say, for people that are staying in dorms to kind of to match them up with uh, maybe persons from a different background and so forth. But uh, uh, when you're when you have an opportunity to uh, meet someone from a diverse background, get to Thank know you. them, get to know them. Uh, uh, um. uh, and, you know, uh, uh, get to know them and, and see what they value and you're going to see that Pretty much they value what you value. Right, so it's not just dispositions uh, towards much, supporting uh, diversity. It really has to yeah. be you have personal experience right. too. Right. With all the well, I, and, and I'm very, I'm, I always tell my students and young people, and my, my own children have taken this on, but I always tell them, get out of your comfort zone. Look for international and global opportunities. Travel around the country. Travel around the world. You'll learn that, you know, what other librarians are doing, what other archivists are doing, what are, what are people, how are people, you know, facing and dealing with some of the same issues that, that you face within your environment. There was a, um, a web webinar recently on for librarians who would who were interested in Fulbrights. And I, it was just fascinating that these librarians had done Fulbrights around the world and had traveled. And this is all paid, you know, through either your institution or through the Fulbright. And there are Fulbrights for graduate students. Learn a foreign language. You know, get out there and meet people. Like Miguel said, don't just spend one or two days. You know, spend a month. Do like a Fulbright will give you that opportunity to spend a few months and learn about other people's culture. Because it, you know, what I what I uh, impress upon them: go somewhere where you are a minority where there are very few people that look like you or think like you or believe like you, you will really get a very different perspective. So that's, that's really something that many of us need to, to embrace. That's something, you know, the, when you mentioned the international experiences, that's something that the iSchool is sort of gearing up for how we can infuse uh, additional international experiences into our courses. And so we've been sort of trying to collect different assignments and different experiences that students yes. can engage in to support that. Right. And, uh, and, and so and, uh, that's something recently, we're definitely interested in. Recently, there's been a whole emphasis on many, on many campuses on engagement, engagement mm -hmm. with the community. Uh, they've created engagement uh, departments. And students need right. to take advantage of that to engage with the diversity that exists in the local community. I would also say that faculty need to do the same thing as well because, uh, but I know it's difficult because 
faculty have to teach, they have a, a family life, there's so many pressures and it sometimes does not allow time to go out in the community and, and get to experience what's out there. But uh, I think it's essential, especially yes. if you uh, take a position in a smaller place, like a small town mm -hmm. or, 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 or a rural setting, um, uh, you have to look for that diversity or, 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 or you have to network uh, uh, to see who's in that community. There might be traditions and customs that you might not know about that could uh, really open your eyes and, mm -hmm. you know, get you to experience something that you've never experienced. Yeah. So well, I, 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 you, I'll, just, I'll just say one last thing. One of the things that you must keep in mind, though, because it is challenging to work internationally or working with diverse populations here in the U.S. We have to continually examine, you know, our own ideas and motivations and expectations. Uh, diversity is always a two-way street, but it can also be used to reinforce, you know, stereotypes and already perceived notions of cultural superiority. So we have to be examining when we do work internationally and we work with diverse populations. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I interrupt you. No, that's excellent. <laughs> you know, are there any other questions out there for Rebecca or Miguel or comments? Looks like we have someone writing in the chat box. Thanks, Renee. Renee's just saying that everything's very insightful. Any other follow-up questions or comments? Well, thank you so much, Miguel and Rebecca. I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to follow up on before we break for today. I just want to thank you so much for your time and your experiences and the enormous amount of work you did to bring this book to fruition, which I think is so important. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate it. And uh, I will be talking about the same things uh, at ALA about the book. And we uh, really do appreciate, I, I sent an email to our contributors letting them know we were going to do this and we'll be putting their names because they did a fabulous job. So um, absolutely, uh, this has been great. And we hope to do more of these kinds of uh, events to, to talk about the work that we're doing. Right. Well, that so sounds wonderful, and it really is helpful because we don't always hear about the latest books that are coming out and the latest mm -hmm. literature, and we all need to work together to make that visible and give voice to our authors. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.